Hello, welcome back. Daily Devotion, we are studying some foundational creeds that really matter to the Christian faith. They matter so much that if you don't believe these things, you cannot legitimately uh, be a Christian. Uh, we're calling this the Believer's Creeds and or the Believer's Creed. We're looking at one at a time. And tonight's going to be a little bit special uh, because we are on part uh, four of a five-part series on the creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, but this is going to do double duty because one of the creeds is also, I believe in the resurrection. And so um, I realized that in putting this together that I couldn't do uh, the series uh, on I believe in the Son of God without talking about the resurrection, because without the resurrection, there is no Christian religion. And the belief and faith in the Son of God is predicated upon the event of the resurrection. So um, this is going to be a double duty, uh, creed number 14, part four of five, and creed number, or no, that was creed number 15, I get these numbers mixed up, and creed number 16 uh, will be um, this one also, and we'll put it up in two different videos uh, so that it will be covered in both. But I believe that this will sufficiently cover the creed, I believe in the resurrection, but it is still part of, I believe in Jesus Christ, the son. How can this be? Well, it, uh, it can be uh, two because it's so important. Now, um, the significant event that happened in Jesus' life was all of them. <laughs> that, that's the real answer. But the truth of the matter is, uh, the most significant uh, capped it off, and that was the resurrection. And without it, none of the other stuff would have mattered because our faith would be useless if there was not a resurrection. And so Jesus came along and he demonstrated the power of God and he demonstrated who he was, uh, not just by what he said and not by the things that he taught and not by the things that he claimed, but also by the things that he did. And so uh, to top that off, he uh, fulfilled over 300 prophetic scriptures uh, in the Old Testament that talked about him coming. And this, of course, too, is uh, some of the most significant evidences uh, that gives us hope and faith and bedrock assurance that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And this, of course, the resurrection is fundamentally most important uh, uh, without taking away from any of the other things, uh, because it capped off exactly the hope that he's offering to you and me. Without this, there is no hope beyond this life. And as the scripture says, if we only have hope in this life, we are above all men most miserable. And so very important to understand that this particular creed is essential to our faith and must be stressed uh, in our life in order for us to be a, uh, a true witness to the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so I want to talk about this. Most of this particular uh, part is going to be scripture. And I'm telling you, if you can't get excited about what this is saying, then there is nothing in Christianity that's real for you because the Holy Spirit confirms that this is the truth. Now, let's talk about some scriptures. And like I said, most of this is going to be scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 14. Here is a great passage about the resurrection. But tell me this, Paul writes, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? They were like the Sadducees. Maybe they were Sadducee holdovers from the times of Jesus. Um, and they were saying in the church, and they were trying to convince other church members that there was no resurrection of the dead. Look at how clearly Paul addresses this issue. Verse 13, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. Think about that. The resurrection was truth, and it was predicated 
on the fact, well, the gospel is predicated on this fact. And if the gospel is predicated on this fact, then people walking around talking about they believe in Jesus and they believe the gospel, but they don't believe in a resurrection is ludicrous. And Paul is making this very clear. If Christ has not been resurrected from the dead, then there is no resurrection, or if there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been resurrected from the dead either. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Do you see how important this is? Do you see how fundamental this is to the Christian faith and the gospel? It is the fundamental question. Christ must have been raised from the dead. And he was, but uh, we want to look at everything that that entails in a few moments. Um, going into Acts chapter 17, verse 31, it says, For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. It's talking about God here. God set a day for judging the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. Look at this. And he, God, proved to everyone who this is by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. This is how God proved that Jesus was that man. The Bible had prophetic scriptures saying that a man would come, someone would come, and God would appoint him. It would be his son. Anyone can show up and claim to be Jesus. But how did God make sure we knew that the man who claimed uh, to be Jesus and the Son of God was, in fact, the Son of God? It wasn't left just to Jesus' word. It was also left to God the Father to raise him from the dead. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest, meaning a harvest like you would go out if you had a field of orange trees and it produced oranges. And at the time that the oranges were ripe, you would go collect all the oranges and then sell them in the market. He is the first orange off the tree. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died, that is believers. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, talking about Adam, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, that is Christ. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Not maybe, not could be, not should be, but will be given new life. Are you getting excited yet? This is talking about you. This is talking about me. This is something that's going to be happening as sure as we're sitting here talking about God and Christ and the scripture. Um, John 14, 19, Jesus said these words, soon the world will no longer see me. I won't be visible to the world, but you will see me since I live, you, since I live, you also will live. And this, of course, is referring to eternal living, not just living. Um, and then in Romans 4, 20 through 22, it speaks of Abraham, and this is a picture here of Abraham having received the promised son that God promised these two old people. She is 90. He is 100 years old. Uh, I believe I've got their ages right. And when they had uh, Isaac, and uh, she had long passed, uh, past the time uh, of women being able to have children, and yet God promised them a child. And you, you might say, well, then how did that work? It worked supernaturally, just like we talked about Jesus's uh, birth uh, and, and coming into the world the first time in the previous lesson. Uh, this was God showing that he is not limited to the human nature and natural functions of the human body. Now, God did not impregnate uh, Abraham's wife. Abraham did. So there is a little difference here. But that baby that they're holding could not possibly be done under normal human uh, effort because uh, this woman was past the age of childbearing. So Abraham, you know, they were promised this child for years and years and years before he came along. And it says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Look at that. That's what's going to be going on in your life. When your faith grows stronger, 
you will be also bringing glory to God. Look at this. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Now, what I'm telling you is I believe in the resurrection and I believe that Jesus was the first one to be res resurrected and I will be a subsequent one who will be resurrected. I believe in this because I believe like Abraham that God is able to do whatever he promises and that means he's able to bring me back from the dead and I and all Christians who believe in Jesus believe this. Now let's go on with the same passage, verse 23 through 25. And when God counted him, and when God counted him, Abraham, as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. See, God was looking ahead and saying, I'm going to count this as righteousness for Abraham, but I'm not just doing it for Abraham. He's not the only one I'm thinking of here. Uh, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded, uh, verse 24, for our benefit to, or also, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord. Now this here is talking about God the Father. If we believe in God the Father, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Now let's word this a little bit differently uh, to be in keeping with what was said earlier. It said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. <clears throat> I just want to point out in the last part of this verse, where it says, make us right with God. Let's just turn that word right to righteousness. That's what that means. Because of our sins and he was raised to life, Jesus was raised to life to make us righteous before God or right with God. That's the two, that's two things that are the same thing. This is what believing in the resurrected Christ means. This is fantastic. Okay, uh, Romans 8, 11, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. You have the Spirit of God. He lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal, that is a body that can die. Uh, he will give life, he's talking about eternal life, to your body that can die by this same Spirit living within you. How do you know his Spirit is living in you? You must be born again. How do you know you're born again? Because you are transformed out of sin and the transformed person is no longer a slave to sin. God's, God will release you from the chains of darkness and the things you used to hate you will now love and the things you used to love you will now hate. You can't, God just ruined sin for a person's life who has faith in Jesus and is born from above. God initiates the born again process. You believe it by faith. You hear the word of God. It's conceived in your heart and it swells up as an everlasting growing thing that God puts in you. The gift of faith that comes into your life and it come and it sprouts into everlasting life. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself with you. <laughs> and I'm talking about you. And he's talking about you. Um, verse 15, all of this is for your benefit. How do you like how personal this is tonight? Uh, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. As more people come to Christ, he is receiving more and more glory and together he's going to raise us with Christ. Now we go to Colossians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. You're getting ready to go there very soon. Could be today. It could be next week. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 50 years from now. It doesn't matter. When it happens, you need to be ready for it. Okay, going on here, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. God, uh, Christ sitting at God's right hand. Uh, is simply an affirmation that he is in all authority in heaven. All right. God is invisible. He doesn't have a visible right hand and he's not there visibly with Christ sitting to the right of him because God is invisible. God, the father is invisible, but Christ sits on the throne of God in the seat of authority. And that's what the right hand signifies. Okay. 
Um, going to uh, verse two, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. I guarantee you, you don't do that enough. I guarantee you that's not a priority in your life because I've, I've met too many Christians that are just, heaven is just something they think they'll think about when they get there. But you know what? We should start doing what it says here in scripture. Verse three, for you die to this life. That's past. You should have already done that. And your real life is hidden with Christ and God. That's the eternal one. And when Christ, who is your life or your real life that was just previously mentioned, is revealed. Now, this is when Christ is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. That's why the picture here has the saints behind Jesus Christ at his second coming, because that is the day that God is going to give a visual glory to Jesus Christ and his saints before all the world at the second coming. We're going up in the rapture. We will be in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will be with Jesus until we come back with him at the second return of Christ. The rapture is not the return of Christ to the earth. He meets us in, or we meet him in the air. But when we come back or when he is revealed to the world, we come back with him and we get to share in his glory. Wow, this is fantastic. And of course, we're resurrected at that point. Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood for only as a human being could uh, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves uh, to the fear of dying. Now, this is fantastic because this is emphasizing what I've already taught you in a previous uh, edition of this particular series. It said, I've got it in color code here for three parts. God's children are human beings. And so what he did was he, uh, that he made Christ a human being for only as a human being could he die. I mentioned this in the last lesson. That's why he had to come and become a man. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. You say, no, he could have broke the power of the devil. He's strong. He could have done it some other way. You're, you're, you're deceived. The Bible tells us he couldn't. This is the only way that he could. You've got to accept that. And he broke the power of the devil because the power of the devil was in the grip of Satan and he had to break his grip. And this is the only way it could be done. This is clear scripture. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying because death was in the power of Satan and God brought it out to his own power by destroying the works of Satan, okay? I hope you'll just accept that and you'll reject all these newfangled ideas that God could just forgive you, not go to the cross. The cross was unnecessary, but he did it to demonstrate how much he loved you. That's bogus, that's ridiculous, it's heresy. That is not true. Christ had to go to the cross or you and I would not have been saved. Um, Hebrews 12, uh, 13 through... Uh, I'm sorry, trying to hurry too fast. I'm out of time. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. That's what Jesus did. He ratified a covenant. The covenant was only good to Abraham and to us if he finally ratified it with his blood. That's what's going on. Even though God gave his word to Abraham, he had not ratified that covenant. He hadn't signed it until the Lord did it on the cross with his own blood. That's how necessary it is. 1 Peter 1, 3, bringing this to a close. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus. How did he, by his mercy, uh, let us be born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Why? Because we are too going to be raised from the dead. Hey, I'm sorry I went over four minutes. God bless you. This is, this is the, you know, if you're going to go over, this is the one to go over on. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. And may the Lord give you a great, absolute, knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confidence that you too are going to partake of that kind of a resurrection.